What's up guys? Today we're going to be looking at motorized bicycle pistons, how to know you installed it correctly, some of the different things like ring end gap, um, dropping it through the cylinder to make sure it's smooth. There's some certain things that we're going to go over in today's video that I really think most engine builders, if you're building an engine at home by yourself, um, some things you got to take into consideration. But let's dive right in. So the first thing that I want to go over is why does everybody tell you to put the piston on the in, on the intake side they'll tell you to put these pins on the intake side um so the reason that everybody gives and i definitely agree with this is on some cylinders those two pins right there um they can actually come in contact with the exhaust port let's say you put it in wrong it could come in contact with the exhaust port but we're going to get to that in just a sec here but that is the reason that everybody gives but here's the way i look at it so let's say your cylinder is just like so and that is your exhaust port, okay? Let's say your piston and piston rings, let's pretend all those are on, just like this piston, okay? Let's just pretend it's like that. So this is the correct way to do it, but you never ever wanna just go by the arrow. The reason I say that is because these pistons are just stamped after they're made. You can see this one has the number three on it and it has an arrow. The arrow is supposed to um, usually go to the exhaust. I say usually because sometimes these things can be incorrectly stamped. Because if you think about it guys, the exhaust side of your motor is always going to be hotter than the intake side. Because if we look at it in this in this way, um, you'll notice that the transfer ports, they point towards the intake to keep that intake charge towards the back to keep the, the back of the engine cool. Well, as the front of the motor is air cooled as well, so air is passing over this. But this is the exhaust side is always going to be hotter. It's just how it is. You can probably see where I'm going with this. You'll notice that these uh, ring end gaps are very tiny, and when they're in the cylinder, they're even more tiny. And when the engine overheats, heat causes expansion, and expansion of the rings causes it to shrink up like that, and because it's getting tighter in the bore. And what will happen is these ring end gaps are going to close up to the point where it's spinning over in the engine, like eight, 9,000 RPM. And one of the rings will actually break off on you. So even if you're running an older style cylinder like this, you're probably saying, oh, well, it doesn't matter if my, my piston's like this because it's not even close to the exhaust port. But you'll notice if we compare, this is a newer kit. These come into about $100 to $150. This is called a G4 cylinder. This is the older style. This is a GT. And you'll notice this is GT simply because it has the narrow ports inside, but also it has a very rough finish. You'll notice that all the cooling fins are very rough, even when they're painted. And they'll usually have the 40 millimeter intake, but I've seen ones with 32. Those are called GTA 5s, but we're not going to get into all that. The point I'm trying to make here is that these newer cylinders have crazy wide exhaust ports. And if you put your piston in backwards, you're almost guaranteed to have a ring snag. So on older cylinders like this one here, you may have been able to get away with it, but on the newer G4s, it's a no-go. So now that we went over that, the correct way to install your piston, now we're gonna be talking about the piston rings themselves. Um, there's a few specs that you gotta go over with these. You gotta put it basically in the bore and we're gonna measure it with a feeler gauge. Um, you can pick these things up guys for like eight to 10 bucks. They're super cheap, easy to get. You could probably get them at any auto parts store or um, you know anything like that. So definitely get yourself a feeler gauge and a caliper if you're dealing with engines. But we're gonna be checking the gap because like I said earlier, these have a very specific gap that they need to be at. And we're going to be going over some other things with these also. So stay tuned. Okay, so now we've all been waiting for, we're actually going to measure the ring end gap. Um, so here's how to do so. What you're going to do is you're going to take your piston ring just like so. You're going to have your cylinder and you're going to stick it vertically in, in the cylinder, right? You're going to push it down a little bit and you'll feel some resistance, but this is so you can get it in perfectly. Then you're going to notice that the ring can move freely and it can pivot. This is gonna be kind of hard to do on camera, but I'm just gonna pivot the ring with my two thumbs like that and seat it into the cylinder. So now it's sort of flush. And this is why I say sort of, because what you need to do to get it perfectly true with the cylinder, you notice how it kind of has a high spot and then it has a low spot. You probably can't get that on camera. You're gonna use your piston that came with your bike and you're just going to insert it and push it down a little bit. And that will, you can buy ring squaring tools and things like that. But guys, for these motorized bicycles, this is all you need. So once you do that, you'll notice that we have a very good um, ring and gap. By the looks of it, it doesn't look too wide. But anyways, we're going to go ahead and 
stick our feeler gauge in there. The number, this is where we're gonna get some controversy. On my engines, I'm not pushing super high RPM. My highest revving bike may be my YD100. That might get to 9,000, maybe. I'm going for 20 thousandths of an inch, okay? That's what I think is usable. You don't want anything really wider than that. And if it's wider than that and you have one ring like that, it's okay. Like I said earlier, just make sure you put that on the bottom ring land. But anyways, we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna show you how to do this. So basically it's pretty easy, honestly. You're gonna see your ring end gap is there and you're just gonna take your feeler gauge and you're gonna stick it in between the ring. And you'll notice on mine, it goes through and I can run it up and down and it's free. So that means that this ring is actually gapped to 20 thousandths. In my opinion, that's perfect. Anything, like I said, over, you can't really do nothing about, but something that is a little bit too tight. Let's say you put it in your cylinder and you're getting like 14 or 50 thousandths, you can get a ring grinder or some people can use sandpaper. It's a little bit sketchy. The reason people use ring grinders is because it's a flap disc and it allows you to really, you know, precisely grind down the ring and not just sand it down. So that's my way of measuring ring gap. Okay, so here's another couple things I wanted to go over. Um, along with ring and gap, there's some other things that you got to check. And that's the fact that if, what kind of cylinder material are you running? Are you running a uh, chrome cylinder, which most of you guys are, the G4 China Dolls, these GT cylinders, some of the older GT5s, they're all chrome cylinders, right? If you're running a saw build, you could be running Nicosil. But if you're running a Minarelli or some kind of other saw, chances are it's going to have an iron sleeve. The, and also the big bore iron sleeve, most people know that motor, the 100cc as it goes. The problem with those motors is everybody, like I find a lot of builders do this and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's definitely not good for the ringing gap, is they'll hone their cylinder, right? They'll, they'll have scoring in it and they'll be like, oh, I can just hone that out. The problem with that is that they go too far. And when they put their uh, ring back into their cylinder, it's way too damn wide and it's just not going to work. Um, it's going to be at 40, 45 thousandths of an inch. That is going to produce no compression and it's never going to hit the pipe, um, the power band, whatever you guys want to call it. So just be careful of that. I'm not saying you can't hone cylinders to get a little bit of the cross hatching back. Once you do it two or three times, man, that cylinder at that point is just not usable. Um, so the benefit iron sleeve, yes, it's kind of like a double life. Once it goes bad, you can hone it out to use it again. But at the end of the day, they're also 30 bucks and you can just buy a new one and, you know, be confident that your ring and gap is going to be right. Um, here's a couple other things as well. You'll notice that this is a really good style of wrist pin um, bearing. I like these a lot better. You may notice that a lot of these newer engines, right, like the G4s and some of the new YDs and stuff, they have this ticking sound. And this all this is either the the lower Conrod bearing itself or the wrist pin. If this is like a moped style, if you guys can upgrade to this, go for it. Because if your engine's ticking and has that crappier bearing, I'll throw up a picture. This is the better bearing to go with. It's wider, so it gives that piston more support when it's on the wrist pin. You can see how that goes. And it also is just better quality. It has a tighter tolerance. Um, this originally came in my Harley Davidson motor, which is this top end, and that thing ran great. It never ticked, it never did nothing like that. But a lot of these newer motors that come with cheaper wrist pins, and you know it's got a lot more noise than what it used to. Um, here's another thing. Man, if you have these G-clips, um, the G-clips are better. These double ears are, this is why everybody's YDs blew up, is because the, not only was the YDs a lot cheaper material, but these two-eared ones, they just don't hold in very well. No matter what position you put at it in the piston, they tend to fly out and destroy your motor. So I would say, here's my recommendation out of all of this. Your ring and gap should be a 20 thousandths of an inch for a street engine. You should have the G-clips for your piston. Your piston pins need to be facing the intake side and have the better wrist pin bearing if you can. If you do all that stuff, you're pretty much set up for success as far as the piston goes. So... That's pretty much it, guys. I'm going to wrap up today's video. Um, but there's also, one before we go, there's one more thing I wanted to say. You're probably questioning, Keegan, why, why, why is the saw build not done? The reality is that bike runs right now, but we had a few complications to do with the cylinder. I'm not going to get into those in today's video. I think what we'll do 
is we'll do a 360 uh, riding video, like where I put the 360 camera on the bike. We're riding along on the road and we'll just talk about the saw build there. But it was a, I don't want to say on YouTube, but you guys know what it was. It, it just didn't work out. Um, there was a lot of issues with the slots on the cylinder, uh, the stud pattern. Basically, in a nutshell, I fired up the bike and the head started rocking. So I didn't want to trash my wadi bottom end because the reality is those are very expensive um, compared to the cheap ones, right? 80cc bottom ends. So I'm not saying this is done. I'm not going to trash saw builds. I think they're great. The way that I was talking to uh, MFL Bikes, he's a pretty good reputable builder. And he said to buy aluminum threaded rod. And I'll throw up another picture. You can put that in your case and it will actually allow you to tap it at the right bolt patterns. And you don't have to worry about any of this crap where the cylinder is rocking back and forth. Because basically what I did is I had to slot the holes a lot and that gave it no meat for it to actually uh, keep the cylinder on the bike. So that's why the YD is back on. Um, I did a YouTube short of it firing up, but I think you guys should definitely take a look at it. So here's what the YD100 is looking like. Um, with that whole saw build, this was a really complicated way of just painting the motor and balancing the crank, but we got her done. Um, a few things that you may notice, obviously, besides the paint job, is this pipe. You're probably saying, Keegan, this is a little bit different of a setup, and you're right. Um, when I did the saw build, I had the issues of the exhaust port being at a different angle than your standard motorized bicycle top ends, right? So what I need to do is just to get it running, because I assumed this was going to work out. I had to make this sort of exhaust and it just so happened to fit on the YD perfectly. Um, pedals clear and everything. So what I'm going to do is, don't mind my silencer, it was painted green but I'm sanding it down to paint it again. I'm a different color. That is going to go like that and it's going to be kind of like a uh, moped style exhaust where it curves under the bike and it goes straight out. It's a pretty cool pipe. Yes, this thing could use a scooter pipe or a real MZ. But I'm confident with that header length and this big carb, when we get this thing on the road and open it up, I'm sure it's going to rip. So that's all I have for you today. Um, if you found this video useful in some way or you learned something or you have any sort of question, make sure to leave in the comments. I'm always active in the comments section. And even when I have a lot more subscribers, I'm probably still going to be in the comments helping people out. So if you're having an issue with your bike or whatever, you know, make sure to comment that and I'll help you out as best I can. But stay tuned for that riding video where we talk about that saw build and I'll see you guys in the next video.